So next main topic of my presentation is isolated focusing with immobilized pH gradients. As we all know, isolectic focusing is a key technology of the 2D workflow. With isolectic focusing, proteins are separated in an electric field on the basis of differences in the isolectic points and independently of their size. The proteins migrate until they reach the isolectic point where the net charge of a protein is zero. The best medium for high resolution isolectic focusing is a so called immobilized pH gradient strip, IPG strip. Commercially available IPG strips are 3 to 4 mm wide and are up to 240 mm long. The IEF polyacrylamide gel is cast on, onto a plastic backing to enable better handling. Important to know that the pH gradient is covenantly fixed and generated during gel casting and that the IPG strips are dried down after casting and the polyacrylamide gel is protected with a thin plastic sheet. Now a few slides on IPG strip rehydration and sample application. So before IEF, IPG strips need to be rehydrated to their original thickness, which is 0.5 millimeter. IPG strip rehydration can be, can be performed with or without sample. I will give you more details on this important topic in a few moments. The composition of the rehydration solution is very similar to the already discussed 2D lysis solution and contains the following components to main solubility of the proteins during IEF. So again, <clears throat> we need keratropic denaturing agents like urea or a combination of urea and thiurea. Again, detergents like CHAPS in a concentration of 2 to 4 percent. Of course, again, TTT, now at a lower concentration compared to our lysis solution, 0.2 percent. Again, carrier polites, uh, the pH gradient usually is 3 to 10, but again, at a lower concentration as, as at 0.5 percent, <coughs> and this, uh, <coughs> which is very important to add a tracking dye. For example, a trace of bromophenol blue to render the IPG strip more visible for simplified handling and to act as a tracking dye for the confirmation of successful focusing. So many people do not differentiate between 2D lysis buffer and rehydration buffer. They just use the original 2D lysis buffer for IPG strip rehydration as well. So I, can, I, can net, I can't recommend that. So please use really this recipe, reduce the amount of TTT in your rehydration buffer and reduce the amount of polites compared to your 2D lysis buffer. IPG strip rehydration can be done with or without sample. Rehydration is usually done in disposable rehydration trays, not in the focusing tray. Rehydration times. So it's about 12 hours with sample, with protein sample, and six to eight hours without sample. After rehydration, the strips are transferred to the focusing tray. And with IPG strips, three different IEF modes are possible which are explained on the next slide. Strips are covered with mineral oil during rehydration and focusing. So in principle, IPG strip rehydration is very easy. So simply pipette the rehydration solution with or without sample along the center of the channels of the rehydration tray. Next, remove the cover sheet from the IPG strip with forceps and then gently place the IPG strip gel side down onto the solution in the channel. So please take care not to trap any air bubbles beneath the IPG strip. IPG strips rehydrated with sample can be run in two different configurations, gel side up or gel side down. But this depends on which focusing trays are, are available in your lab. Highly recommended from my side is gel side up focusing. This focusing strategy usually leads to better and, and reproducible, more reproducible results. If IPG strips are rehydrated without sample, then sample application is done with sample cups, which are placed on the gel of the IPG, of the IPG strip, usually, usually on the acidic side. Sample cups offer an alternative method of sample loading, 
and the use can often improve resolution, especially at extreme pH ranges and for hydrophobic proteins. So here are a few comments on the power conditions for analytic focusing with IPG strips. Both the pH gradient and the electric field strength influence the time required to reach steady state conditions. The electric field strength is determined by the applied voltage and the length of the IPG strip. In general, narrow pH traces yield higher resolution, but require higher voltages and more time to reach steady state conditions. Validated protocols for each, each strip type are available from Barrett, so you don't have to run any optimization experiments. Usually the focusing scheme <clears throat> for all IPG strips are the same and consists of four steps. The first step is always a low voltage step at 250 volt for 20 minutes. Step two ramps up to maximum voltage in one hour. The most important step is step three, called the high voltage phase, which leads to steady state conditions after a few hours. The duration of step three is dependent from the amount of protein loaded, the length and the type of your IPT strip. <coughs> step four is just a whole step, just to keep the focus proteins at the isolated point. This is very important if you are, for example, late to work. Here's a summary of the most important parameters in IF with IPG strips. So again, IPG strip rehydration time is about 12 hours with proteins, six to eight hours without proteins. Focusing temperature all around the world is always 20 degrees Celsius. The maximum current you can apply per strip is 50 microamps. And maximum voltage is strip length dependent. For example, 4,000 volt for seven centimeter strips 8,000 volts for 11 centimeter strips, 10,000 volts for 17, 18, and 24 long IPG strips. This is now very important. Very important is the usage of paper wicks, which are moistened with distilled water, which are placed between the IPG strip and the electrode assembly. The paper wicks serve as a reservoir for ionic contaminants during isolectic focusing. This usually leads to better results. And after the run, you can use your IPG strips right away, or they can be stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius in the rehydration tray. So this slide is about instrumentation for isolated focusing. Barrett's Protein I12 IF system is really the best instrument on the market because it offers individual lane control. So the instrument provides 12 power supplies for 12 strips. Therefore, it is possible to process different samples and different IPG strips in a single run. This is not possible with other instruments on the market. In addition, the focusing tray is very flexible. It accommodates all sample application and focusing types, gel side up, gel side down, and cup loading. And very important is also data visualization. This is possible with the Protein I12 reporter, a free web-based application found at www.i12reporter.com. The biggest disadvantage of current uh, generation IEF systems is that 12 IEF strips are run with a single power supply. But as we all know, Ohm's law dictates that the current varies from strip to strip if the resistance is variable. Controlled IEF is therefore only possible if the IPG strips are identical and all the samples have similar conductivity. On the other hand, with the protein I12, voltage and current to each strip are individually controlled. This concept offers much more flexibility. For example, you can run different samples in different IPG strip, strips simultaneously. The next slide shows us the practical benefit of this concept. With our protein I12 cell, it is possible to run samples samples which differ in conductivity. In this case, six different 2D sample buffers. The goal of this experiment was to find out which sample buffer yields the most spots on the, on the corresponding gels. And here the winner is sample solution four. It yields about 500 spots. This approach is not possible with other conventional IEF cells on the market. So as you can see, you can really, whatever, test a few sample buffers. You can uh, 
test a sample preparation strategies in a single run and gives you immediately uh, results and then you can continue with two dimension of uh, the second dimension. Another obvious advantage of the Protein I-12 instrument is current profile monitoring, which enables true process control. Usually poor focusing correlates with an abnormal current profile as you can see here for gel number two. If you observe abnormal current profiles, you can eliminate the corresponding strips from the 2D workflow. This saves a lot of time and money. Again, so this is not possible with current instrumentation on the market. In the next few slides, I would like to summarize all the critical points for isolated focusing, namely the rehydration of IPG strips, how we apply the sample, protein load, and the choice of pH gradients. So rehydration of IPG strips is very, very important. Rehydration of IPG strips must be performed in a volume controlled manner. It is not recommended to apply less rehydration volume as suggested in the table. However, it is possible to overswell the IPG strips by 10 to 20% if you work with very diluted uh, protein samples. And again, IPG strip rehydration can be performed with and without sample. So this sample is called in gel rehydration, and this, uh, if you rehydrate without sample, you have to follow the cup loading strategy. The picture of this 2D gel shows vertical regions of poor focusing. The possible causes here are that a few areas of the IPG strip were not properly wetted with the sample solution. As a consequence, the gel sticks to the bottom of the rehydration tray and gets not fully rehydrated. So if you run such a strip in your IEF cell, the proteins will immediately precipitate on this position, as you can see here. Another explanation would be that too little rehydration solution was applied at all. So again, rehydration of the IPG strip is very, very critical, and please take your time to perform this process. The next critical success factor is protein loading. IPG strip overloading usually leads to local distortions, especially if a few highly abundant proteins are in your sample solution. The table on this slide suggests protein loads as a function of strip length and staining technique. Sometimes a single protein spot on a 2D gel represents more than one polypeptide. As you can see here, if you compare spot resolution on the IPG 4-7, and on the, on the other hand, IPG 4.5 to 5.5. So if you are really interested in a detailed protein isoform characterization, you have to use narrow range IPG gradients. And of course, uh, don't work with seven centimeter strips. You have to increase strip lengths up to whatever 24 centimeters if isoform, characteriz isoform characterization is the goal of your experiment. So after the run, uh, we do a so-called equilibration step with the IPG strips. And the purpose of this equilibration step is to coat the proteins with the SDS in order to transfer the proteins from the IPG strip into the SDS gel. Usually, the equilibration stock buffer consists of urea, glycerol, and 2% SDS in the TRIS buffer. Duration of equilibration is 2 times 10 to 15 minutes. And as we all know, equilibration solution contains TTT, and equilibration solution 2 contains uracetamide. So again, we're doing here re reducing an alkylation step in two-dimensional electrophoresis. Step 3 in our 2D workflow is SDS electrophoresis, the separation of proteins according to the molecular weight. A variety of electrophoresis cells are available at Biorad to accommodate all lengths of IPG strips between 7 and 24 centimeter. For high throughput, Bayrat offers different Dodica cells, which can run up to 12 gels at the same time. So what are now the pros and cons of the different SDS gel sizes? The mini protein tetra cell accommodates 7 centimeter long IPG strips. This cell is excellent for rapid analysis and method development, but of course, spot resolution is somehow limited. The criterion cell, which is a MIDI format, accommodates 11 centimeter long IPG strips. 
The Criterion Gel format offers the best combination concerning, concerning speed and spot resolution, especially with the use of overlapping IP3 strips. For example, if you combine pH gradients 3 to 6, 5 to 8, and 7 to 10 to cover really the, the full range between 3 and 10. So this combination is sometimes superior to the large format gels because you're focusing lengths is up to 30 centimeters now. But of course, we have also large format systems like the Protein 2, a Protein Plus Dodeco cell available, say accommodate 17 to 24 centimeter IPG strips. These selective freezes cells provide high spot resolution, but require very long run times, sometimes also overnight. So at BioRad, we recommend to use gels with our TGX chemistry. TGX is the abbreviation for Tris Glycine Extended Shelf Life. So what are now the benefits of BioRad's TGX precast gels for SDS page? In general, of course, precast gels provide the highest reproducibility and they are therefore superior to handcast gels. The TGX gel system enables very fast SDS page runs you are done in, a, in approximately five, 35 minutes. And the gels can be used to run with inexpensive Swiss glycine SDS running buffers. And in addition, many different single percentage or gradient gels are available from BioRad. Shelf life is also great. You can store the TGX gels for more than one year, and they are also available with the so-called stain-free chemistry. Stain-free chemistry means that you don't have to stain your gels, you just activate your gels under UV light and you get uh, signals from your proteins um, with a suited camera system. So very quick and easy and very convenient. And last but not least, CGX gels have excellent blotting characteristics and very, very high transfer efficiency in combination with this BioRats Transplot Turbo system, which is a semi-dry system. So this is very important information for you if you're interested to do 2D Western blotting. So Precision Plus Protein Standard Plugs are a unique product for accurate molecular weight determination. The standard proteins are cast in one millimeter thick agarose plugs for easy storage, handling, and loading. The system is very, very easy to use. Just snap, twist, and load the gel plug onto any gel type. The plugs provide an ideal 10 range uh, from 10 kilodalton to 250 kilodalton, with is usually the separation range of two-dimensional electrophoresis, and uh, included are three high-intensity reference bands, uh, which allows instant gel orientation. Molecular weight determination with those plugs is also very accurate with our standard proteins. The R square value is close to one. So this slide is about protein staining, which is very important for quantitation. For the relative quantitation of protein spots between different samples, please use fluorescent dyes like flamingo pink or aureole, because commercial or silver staining techniques have a very, very limited dynamic range, and it's not possible with those dyes to do accurate uh, comparison between samples. In addition, flamingo pink and aureole fluorescent gel stains are exceptional in terms of ease of use, sensitivity, linearity, and compatibility with mass spectrometric analysis. For example, protein staining with aureole is a simple one-step staining process without protein fixing and no destaining. Protein samples can be accurately visualized and quantitated in less than two hours. So very, very convenient and fast. So now two comments on the recommended imaging equipment for optimal performance of the dyes. Aureole works best with camera systems with UV excitation, and laser scanner systems are ideally suited for flamingo pink. So this slide describes the typical 2D gel analysis workflow. For two-dimensional gel analysis, you need a suited software package like PDQuest and BioRad. PDQuest is more than 20 years on the market and is very, very user-friendly. All important evaluation steps like spot detection, gel matching, and data analysis are performed automatically. After data analysis, for example, if you look for deregulated spots, the 
corresponding protein spots are excised with a spot cutter, like the X-Quest from Barrett, and identified by mass spectrometry. These MS datasets can then be re-imported to PDQuest, and the spots are automatically on annotated. The result of this workflow is a powerful and comprehensive 2D protein database, which contains all information concerning your proteomics experiments. And you can find quite a few PDQuest tutorials on the BioRed website. So this is the last slide of my talk. It titles Further Reading and Information about Electrophoresis. So you can find a few tips here for further reading, like all the comprehensive BioRed bulletins on electrophoresis and blotting. If you are interested to learn more about the Protein I-12 IEF system, so please download, download uh, the publication from Berkelman. It's about a bulletin 6138. If you want to learn more about the so-called 2D to go workflow, which uh, describes an interlab study with all the products from Barrett, uh, please, uh, refer to, to my publication. So the publication is published in Archives of Physiology and Biochemistry this year. So it really shows how you can reproducibility and stability of the 2D workflow. If you are interested to learn more about sample preparation, so recently I've added a book which is called Sample Preparation and Fractionation, published by Humana Press in 2008. Professor Rigetti is like the king of immobilized pH gradients, so he has published a book in, book in 1990. It's called Theory and Methodology on Immobilized pH Gradients. And one of my colleagues, Rainer Westermeyer, has published a book in 2006. It's called Electrophysis in Practice. And there you can find all tips and tricks for DNA and protein electrophoresis. So thank you for your interest, and Sarah is now organizing all your Q&A sessions, and again, thank you for staying with us. Dr. Posh, thank you very much for the informative talk. We have some questions from the audience. The first question is in regards to sample cleanup. Can you provide tips to avoid sample losses when using the 2D cleanup kit? Yes, I can. So um, what most people don't know, the rule of thumb is not to overdry the protein pellets. And please dissolve the protein pellet with 2D sample buffer at room temperature or slightly, slightly elevated temperatures. So don't put the protein pellet on ice during the resolubilization step. And also sonication or grinding with a small pestle during pellet re resolubilization is also recommended. So, But the, the key message here is don't put your protein pellet on ice during resolubilization. What is the maximum storage life of protein samples in minus 20 degrees Celsius? And how many freeze-thaw cycles do you recommend? I just recommend <clears throat> one cycle uh, and the storage time at minus 20 degrees, I would say, is at least three months, yeah. What are the recommended running conditions for 11 centimeter IPG strips run on criterion gels, and how long should the gel be run? So um, this is very important. So uh, usually you cannot apply uh, running protocols from, from one D electrophoresis. So in 2D electrophoresis, we, we start off with, this, with the second dimension at low voltages, like 50 volts for 15 to 20 minutes. And then you can continue with a maximum voltage, for example, 200 volts for 30 minutes. So we want to start off at low voltages because this enables a better protein transfer out of the IPG strip into the SDS gel. So slow in the beginning, and then you can ramp up to the recommended maximum uh, conditions. If there is no pellet after the 2D cleanup kit, what could be the problem? <laughs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> no pellet. So of course, I would 
would first really check the quality of my protein sample. So I always talk to my students or um, discuss with my students, why don't you run your sample first on a 1D gel to, to check the quality? This is so simple. If you run your gel and have a, a reference sample, you can immediately see uh, how the sample looks like, is there enough protein there, and so forth, and then you can continue. So I, first of all, I really would do this quality check before I continue with any experiments. Uh, in this particular well, this particular answer, uh, question I cannot answer because I don't know nothing about uh, the sample buffer which uh, the proteins are dissolved. Perhaps we, we can discuss this over email. Do you have recommendations for protocols to extract proteins from plant samples? Yeah, usually um, plant samples are best uh, prepared with liquid nitrogen. So with a mortar and a pestle, liquid nitrogen, this is really the, the best way followed by TCA acetone precipitation. This uh, gives usually no problems on, on 2D maps. But again, there are many, many protocols in the book I've edited, and also I'm happy to discuss uh, these issues with, with, with the people uh, which are live here. Due to unavoidable circumstances, is it okay to increase the passive rehydration time? Yeah, so it's no problem to to rehydrate the strips for overnight or even longer, 18 hours, 24 longer. It doesn't matter really. Yeah, it's, this is possible. What is the best method for sample quantitation after sample preparation but before IEF? The most um, <coughs> recommended um, protein assay, so I've worked with many protein assays in my life and I really like the RCDC kit from Biorad because this kit gives really accurate results and is compatible with any, any uh, chemicals in, in, your, in your protein sample. So because this kit includes also precipitation step and therefore I would recommend to use the RCDC kit. Can you use TCEP instead of TBP for re reduction and alkylation of the proteins before IEF? In principle, yes, but I've never tried it. Uh, so I don't know um, the quality of so this approach, but in theory it's possible, yes. At what temperature should the rehydration step be performed? You can do your uh, Rehydration step in your IEF cell, so just turn on the power and whatever, uh, start cooling and do the rehydration step at 20 degrees Celsius. If you don't want to use your IEF cell, just, just put it on, on your table in, in the lab. And don't forget to put mineral, mineral oil on your strips. How many technical replicates do you recommend per sample? So I usually run three technical replicates per sample because two-dimensional electrophoresis is not a perfect method. So if you run 10 gels, uh, nine looks usually very good, So, but one is, is not optimal, and therefore I'm running three replicates per sample. Uh, but of course, you also have to run biological replicates to get your data published in the journals. Do you have recommendations for identifying phosphorylated proteins in the 2D gel? <clears throat> I think um, the best approach is really to use specific antibodies. So over the last 10 to 15 years, the quality of those phosphor-specific antibodies have improved a lot, and this is my rec recommended approach. So, of course, there uh, are specific dyes on the market which stain phosphoproteins, but if you 
really want to be sure uh, about that, I would I would stay with uh, specific antibodies. Is it possible to run protein samples dissolved in 2D sample buffer on 1D SDS page gels? Yes, of course. This is uh, what I'm always recommending. So check your check the quality of your proteins uh, uh, after your your sample preparation protocol. You can just add two percent. SDS to your sample solution, or you just can dilute your sample with highly concentrated, highly concentrated Lambley buffer. So just incubate on the sample for 15 minutes in room temperature, and you're ready to go. But please don't heat the sample to avoid carbamylation of your proteins because you have urea or thiourea in your sample. But this approach is, is very helpful if you want to check the quality of your sample to this 1D page. How can researchers improve reproducibility in their 2D experiments? Yeah, clear question, short question. So, yes, I have to work according to SOPs. So, any step matters in, in, in two-dimensional electrophoresis because it's a very, very long process. And if, if you want to be reproducible, you really have to stay with your protocol and, yeah, Work, really work according to SOP, SOP conditions and don't take any shortcuts. What kind of information can you get from doing 2D experiments without doing further studies like mass spectrometry and Western blotting? Yeah, you can get, of course, uh, the quantity relative, relative to other proteins uh, on the 2D map, isoelectric point and molecular weight, but that's it. So you, you get really three important parameters, but usually, uh, yeah, and of course you can detect up and down regulation compared to another sample, which is also helpful, yeah. How can you reduce background staining during silver staining? So there are approximately 50 sil silver staining protocols um, on the market, and it's very important to know which silver staining protocol our customer has used. So uh, perhaps he, wanna, he or she want to send me the protocol. I can look over it and give some recommendations. What are your recommendations? Oh, but, but, Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, what I, what I can say, uh, of course, silver staining is is, is a very delicate uh, technique. Uh, uh, it's time dependent. It it relates on high quality chemicals, uh, high quality staining trays, no dust and so forth. So this is the first thing I would would, would comment on that. But uh, again, so it's it's not possible to to give any further recommendations because I don't know what kind of silver staining protocol our customer is using. What are your recommendations if a scientist is trying to choose between 7 centimeter and 11 centimeter IPG strips? So I, I personally prefer 11 centimeters because they really give very, very high resolution maps and uh, run times are pretty short. Um, I usually don't work with seven centimeter strips. Um, what I recommend is use seven centimeter strips for whatever optimization uh, of your protocols. But if you want to have real data, well resolved spots, in combination with overlapping IPG gradients, I would I would uh, choose to use the Calcarian gel format. This is really the, the best combination between speed and resolution. What do you recommend for cleaning all glassware and plasticware between experiments? Oh, whoa, whoa. Um, 
actually it's it's just it's just simple uh, how do you say household uh, soap <laughs> that's all I'm, I'm using in my lab and I never had any problems but people are also using uh, acids uh, diluted acids uh, alcohols to, to, to clean their glassware but I usually have never problems when I'm using just uh, simple soap for SDS page should you heat your samples at all with the loading buffer before loading them on the gel? I've seen protocols written with heating and also without heating. So you're now referring to one D page? Running the SDS page gel in a 2D experiment. Uh, no, don't, don't heat your sample. Uh, I don't recommend. So if you if your sample contains urea and thiourea, never heat your never heat your sample. What are the conditions for optimal transfer of proteins from the IPG strip to the SDS page gel? Yes, that's a very important point. Um, yeah, in order to ensure the good, a good contact between the strip and the gel, we usually apply agarose solution, 0.5% uh, dissolved in running buffer. And the agarose not only keeps the IPG strip in place, but also ensures good electrophoretic transfer between the IPG strip and the gel. And again, as I told you before, please start uh, your SDS page run at low voltages, usually 50 volts for 15 minutes, and then you can continue with uh, the recommended voltage uh, from your gel supplier, for example, 200 volts for criterion gels. What is the preferred position for sample cups on the rehydrated IPG strips for sample cup loading? So, um, so we have two choices. We can put the sample cups either at the anodic or on the cathodic side. And over the years, we have found out that anodic cup loading is superior to cathodic uh, cup loading. So 95% of all gels we have run, the anodic cup loading was much better, much uh, gave better reproducibility and, and higher spot resolution compared to the cathodic cup loading. What are your recommendations for excising proteins from a Tris HCL criterion 4 to 20 percent gel, do you need to remove the SDS from the sample? You you mean exciting spots from from a from a gel? Yes. To then analyze by mass spectrometry. Yeah, sim simply put the, the plug into water and wash it several times uh, to get rid of, of SDS and all other uh, whatever gel components. That's very easy. So in, ex wash your gel plug several times with distilled water, and then you can store your plugs at minus 20 degrees for at least six months without any quality losses. But washing is essential, of course, just with water. We are currently using Tris HCL precast criterion gels 4 to 20 percent. If we want to get better separation of the proteins, should we change the percentage of the gel, or what would you recommend? So for two-dimensional elective freezes, um, most people in the world are using 12.5 percent uh, Gradient, not gradient gels, gels, so no gradients, just uh, simple, plain 12.5% gels. So those gels are giving the best resolution between 250 kilodalton and 10 kilodalton. Final question of the webinar. 
for scientists that are using mass spectrometry to identify spots, how do you recommend that they store their excised protein spots for later mass spec identification? Yeah, usually um, you cut out your spots. Uh, if you're using a spot cutter, your gels uh, are in a micro titer plate with water and just put, put a lid on and whatever, freeze your gel plugs uh, at minus 20 degrees and this is enough. So a very simple approach. So as you can see, our 2D gels, 2D gel is, is um, really whatever, a sample collector, so to say, and it's very, very easy to store the gel plugs in water at minus 20 degrees. Thank you very much, Dr. Posh, and thank you to everyone that attended the BioRad 2D Tips and Techniques webinar. For any of you that had questions that we were not able to get to today, someone from BioRad will follow up with you in the next two weeks. For more information on 2D electrophoresis and educational resources, please visit www.bio-rad.com backslash 2D info. This URL is displayed at the bottom of your screen, and a link can also be found in the resource folder. If you would like to get a copy of the slides presented today, you can also download those from the resource folder. Thank you very much and have a great day.